I had it ingrained in me that sleep was not that necessary. And, you know, part of it in those days, we just didn't understand. Fortunately, since at least 2006, when uh, Dr. Jeffrey Illiff and Nattergaard out of the University of Rochester came up with this whole process that we didn't appreciate before called the brain's glymphatic system, which is basically the process that flushes out all the toxins that build up and accumulate throughout the day and gets rid of them. And we take out the garbage, so to speak, and we flush the system, we flush the brain of all these uh, irritants, toxins, etc. This only effectively happens while we sleep. Welcome to another episode. I'm so glad that we get to hang out today. Thanks for bringing me into your day. Today, we're talking about changes, how to make lasting changes and why it's so important to bite off what we can chew thoroughly and consistently. So we're going to be talking about sleep. We're going to be talking about stress and workouts and eating. We're going to really be just busting through some of the reasons why we have a hard time sticking to our goals and how to optimize our health one step at a time from sleep, food, movement, energy, metabolism, gut health. We're breaking all, down all of the like big components so that you can be really spot on and adjust as you see fit, as opposed to kind of flailing over your health, which I know many of us do. Our guest today is Dr. Thomas Hemingway, who's a holistic and integrative medical doctor who lives and shares his personal and professional philosophy of prevention over prescription. He has the goal of saving 100 million lives by optimizing health and wellness through natural means. His book, Preventable, Five Powerful Practices to Avoid Disease and Build Unshakable Health, describes the foundational principles of creating solid lifelong health and avoiding the leading causes of death world wide. He also loves sharing this message in his top rated health podcast, Unshakable Health. I've been on his show, I think at least once, maybe twice, where he is also known for distilling down the latest medical knowledge and science into easily digestible and actionable steps that can change our lives in the present and future. He is also a husband and proud father of six wonderful humans with whom he enjoys spending time in the outdoors, surfing, snowboarding, skiing, hiking. Every time he's on a story, he's in a different place. So super fun. Um, his website is thomashemingway.com and his book is The Prevent preventablebook.com. Okay, let's cut over to today's episode. Hey, my name is Leanne Vogel. I'm fascinated with helping women navigate how to eat, move, and care for their bodies using a low-carb diet. I'm a small-town holistic nutritionist turned three-time international best-selling author turned functional medicine practitioner, offering telemedicine services around the globe to women looking to better their health and stop second-guessing themselves. I'm here to teach you how to wade through the wellness noise to get to the good stuff that'll help you achieve your goals. We're supporting your low carb life beyond the, if it fits your macros conversation, hormones, emotions, relationship to your body, workouts, letdowns, motivation, blood work, detoxing, metabolism. I'm providing the tools to put your motivation into action. Think of it like quality time with your bestie mixed with a little med school. So you're empowered at your next doctor visit. Get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn about your body and how to care for it better. This is the Keto Diet Podcast. Hey, Dr. Thomas, how are you? Oh man, I'm doing great, Leanne. So nice to be here with you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. Of course. Anytime. You are just a blast to chat with. I can't wait to go through all the things we have planned. In a couple of moments, just tell us what lights you up and why you do the work that you do. Oh my gosh. A couple of moments. That might be hard, but yeah, just a <laughs> quick, uh, quick kind of what uh, makes me tick, what gets me excited. Well, you know, my, my traditional training is in Western medicine. And so I spent a couple of decades working in hospitals, clinics, ERs, especially I'm board certified ER doctor, but what got me really kind of back to my roots, if you will, because as a kid, I was always super holistic, super interested in how the body ticked, what made it work, you know, what was the nuance at the microscopic level, all those things. But then, you know, in medical school, it was pretty rote. We got the traditional, you know, teaching about physiology and pathophysiology and what's disease. And then, you know, sort of the knee jerk uh, treatment to disease, which most often sadly involves pharmaceuticals. And about a decade ago, I was working 
And I was in, in the ER where I was spending a lot of time working, helping folks there. But what, what started to happen more and more frequently, which was really weird because first time in my career, really, that people were coming in younger than I. Now, mind you, I'm in my 40s at the time. I'm, I'm turning 50 soon. But folks were coming in with first-time heart attacks, first-time strokes, you know, all sorts of autoimmune conditions, cancers and things. And many of them were younger than I. And I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, what is going on here? You know, when I did my medical training 20 years ago, every heart attack patient I saw was in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Nobody in their 30s and 40s, like, what gives? What's happening? What's going on with our society? And and I just felt like, you know, we are sadly avoiding, you know, the real problems that are literally staring us in plain sight. You know, the most common illnesses out there are almost entirely preventable, things like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, you know, the number one killer in women and men, of course, worldwide is literally taking us at a younger age each and every year. And we got to do something more. We got to do something different. And so I just got really passionate about helping people dig a little deeper, get to the root of what really causes illness in the first place, and then not only help them to literally cure their disease, but prevent a lot of this from ever occurring in the first place. So that's what lights me up. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning. That's why I love to do this and share this and work with people because really there is so much within our power, under our control, way more than we could ever imagine. Over 90% of all health conditions literally depend on us, the so-called epigenetics of what we get to control, the things under our control, not just those genes that our parents gave us. We can't just blame them for everything. And so it's exciting, it's empowering, and just lights me up. (laughs) That is awesome. And so a little... I'm sure there are people that just heard that and it's so encouraging. And also you said like real problems, like the preventable things, diabetes, heart disease. What do you think is driving these things? Like you're seeing younger and younger people come in to see you and you are seeing people in the hospital. And so what what do you know to be true now of what's happening to them? Why are they getting younger and younger? What are some of the components? Yeah, I would say, you know, everything boils down to inflammation. Inflammation is at the root of just about every disease known to man from heart disease to cancer to diabetes. Obesity, in fact, is an inflammatory condition. Even what goes on upstairs, you know, our mental health challenges, whether it be anxiety, depression, that is literally inflammation of the brain. And the primary driver of this inflammation is the stuff that we do or don't do. And it starts with what lies at the tip of our fork. It literally starts with what we eat each and every day. And then what we do and we don't do with respect to our movement, our sleep, our stress optimization, all these other factors. But food is a huge part of that. It literally can turn on or off genes and can govern whether or not we get this inflammation, which leads to all these conditions like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, neurodegenerative conditions, and mental health disorders. I mean, it literally starts with inflammation. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And how detailed do you feel the diet needs to be? Because a lot of People listening to this podcast are pretty familiar with keto and they've maybe been eating keto for at least a couple of months or low carb and they're still dealing with inflammation. Do you think that's because there could be other things going on or do you think that a keto diet isn't a keto diet? Like there can be all different types and inflammation can still exist in that paradigm. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a little bit of both. You know, there's kind of the keto, there's sort of a, a dirtier version of keto, there's a cleaner keto. I think if you just really try to focus on whether it be keto or whatever diet you are doing, as long as you're getting real whole food ingredients, what I like to call just the single ingredient food, stuff that doesn't need a label, right? It doesn't need you know a whole ingredients list of 50 things. It literally has one thing you look at. It's a grass-fed steak or it's uh, well-raised you know, eggs if you eat eggs or poultry or fish. I love wild-caught fish. You know, It doesn't need an ingredients list. And I think what, what's interesting, and I've kind of seen you know this over... Over time, you know, one of the first, and I think most of your listeners and viewers will be familiar with the Atkins diet, for example, one of the original kind of ketogenic diets. And in those days, there wasn't a lot of focus so much on quality of the food so much as just the macronutrient profile, right? We were shooting towards elevating the amount of fats that we were eating in our diet. We weren't focusing so much on what constitutes, you know, a healthy fat versus a garbage fat, if you will. And so it's about the quality, I think, more then more often than not, that will ultimately contribute to inflammation or not. Because there is definitely sort of a dirty way to do keto and there's a cleaner way, right? If we're just buying the pork rinds at the store that maybe have seed oils in them and other kinds of garbage that they throw in there, or if we have a pork rind that literally just says, 
you know, the pork meat and then salt. It's like, okay, well, I, I understand that ingredient. There's two things in there. There's salt and then there's the pork. Okay, that makes sense to me. <laughs> you know, so I think, I think quality does matter. And if we go back to sort of the original source, which is a single food, you know, whole food ingredients list, and then comprise whatever macros are making us thrive, I think that's a great place to start. Kind of eliminating all the noise and all the extra uh, ingredients as well as those that aren't so healthy for us. You know, like the seed oils, for example, as far as non-healthy fats. Completely. And what I'm really hearing from you is simplicity. It's that food is medicine approach. And I think a lot of people can get really hung up on if it fits your macros and all these little details when ultimately what you're saying is the less ingredients, the better, the more natural, the better. And by doing this, it can influence energy, clarity, weight loss, and some of those, well, and inflammation is really how we got started on this topic. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. And and, and it really, the simplicity is right there. I mean, if you go to the, the source, you know, whether it be with your healthy fats, your healthy proteins, you go right to the source and you kind of you know, get rid of all those extra ingredients, which happens with almost anything you can get at the grocery store that comes in a bag or in a box or with a barcode. Like I always like to help people to remember it that simply is avoid the three B's, you know, just go to simple whole uh, foods, single ingredient uh, foods that are hopefully well raised uh, as well and procured in a way that is humane and all of that sort of thing. You can't go wrong. I mean, that's what our ancestors did, you know, millennia ago. And they never died of heart disease. Maybe they had an infection because they didn't have antibiotics, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> it really is. It really is. So how is this approach different to dieting? You talked a little bit about just if it fits your macros when it comes to keto, you're really just thinking, how can I hit my fat amount and not really caring about the quality? Other factors in relation to like food as medicine that then maybe takes a different approach to a standard quote unquote diet? Yeah, I would say the other thing that I like to focus on in addition to, you know, quality macros is the timing of your food. You know, right now, one of the biggest plagues that uh, really is occurring with society today is we as humans tend to be eating every hour that we are awake. So if you think about it, we're awake on average 16 or more hours a day. And the latest uh, research shows that we literally are eating you know, upwards of 16 plus hours a day. And so we're never giving our bodies a break to do what we really need as far as to refresh the system, to cleanse ourselves, to dump all the toxins that we're exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're not allowing time for our metabolism to really work and to work smoothly to assimilate all of these nutrients that we're taking in. Because what we didn't understand maybe a decade or so ago was that this is a really taxing process when we eat and we metabolize our food. First, we got to digest it. We got to break it down. We got to assimilate it back into the proteins that we need to build whatever it may be within the cells or the intracellular organelles. This whole process is super energy intensive. And if we're doing it all day long and we never give our bodies a break, this is actually a driver of chronic stress and inflammation right then and there. Our bodies actually need time to flush, to take out the garbage, so to speak. And this is kind of a topic I love to kind of elaborate on a little bit because most people have heard of, for example, the phenomenon of autophagy, right? There was a Nobel Prize given, I think about six years ago, for the work on autophagy. And that is a process that we really, really want. <laughs> like this is something that will help us so much, but it can't happen if we're eating all day long. It just cannot happen. The physiology does not allow it to happen. And so taking breaks between meals or even doing a little bit of a kind of a circadian fast is what I like to call it. I think the intermittent fast is kind of misunderstood because there's so many varieties out there. People hear that word and they're like, okay, I got to go 16, 18, 20 hours before I eat and I got to do this OMAD thing. And they just overcomplicate things. And I think what we really need to focus on is we just need to allow our body to take a simple break, hopefully at least 12 hours every single day. And then if we can do some prolonged fast once in a while, maybe a couple times a month, we'll do a 24-hour, 48-hour, even 72-hour that's extra bonus points. And that's really where the autophagy and the magic happens. But just simply taking a break and not snacking all day long, which is sadly what a lot of nutritionists and physicians still teach. That you got to eat every two to three hours. That's what keeps your metabolism going. Eh, malarkey, that is not a great way to go. So <laughs> timing is important too. Timing matters. <laughs> Completely. And another simplicity, you know, we just finished talking about food as medicine. 
and the least amount of product like ingredients the better and now we're into fasting which really sounds like more of a natural process any tips you know because you're saying you know just don't eat for 12 hours if somebody's listening where that seems absolutely impossible do you have tips in order to like get started with more of that natural process because i know for us we've been doing this a really long time fasting 24 hours not a big deal for me but you know when you first get started it can be kind of overwhelming and you're hearing like just, you know, fast through the night and you're like, I don't think I'm going to make it. How do we, how do we start to incorporate that slowly? Yeah, no, I I would say the easiest approach is what I call the overnight circadian fast. So most of us want to strive to sleep eight hours, right? So we already have eight hours under our belt, provided we're not waking up in the middle of the night going, oh crap, I have this, you know, a little bit of hunger pain, maybe because I ate a little bit of a carbohydrate meal towards the end of the day and two to three hours later, like clockwork, guess what? Our body tells us, hey, we might need a little something extra because of the uh, what we call reactive hypoglycemia. But provided that's not a big issue, if we have our eight hours that we're sleeping, that's you know kind of the starting point. And then what I recommend folks is just to try to not eat for a couple hours before bed. Ideally, this is three hours before bed. So try to push your Uh, evening meal up a little bit. Try to eat closer to 5 or 6 o'clock at night. Be done. Let's say if you're done by 6 p.m., well, that's super easy. I mean, you could eat again at 6 a.m. That's 12 hours later. That doesn't sound that hard. I think most people have a hard time pushing that dinner up a little bit. So let's just say that you are finished with dinner at 8 p.m. So all that means is that you don't eat any calories until 8 a.m. So if you rise early like I do at 6 Then you might get up, drink a full glass of water, which is amazing for your health anyway. You might get on with a little bit of a fasted workout, whether that's a walk to get your day going, get some light into your eyes, whatever that is. And then you just don't eat until 8 a.m. And that's a simple 12-hour circadian fast. And I really believe that's something anyone can do. And even the ladies out there that are listening, you probably know this, during your cycle, when you have your fluctuating hormones, there are better times and worse times to fast. I really feel like the 12-hour overnight, what I like to call the circadian fast, is doable any time of the month. We know that in the first part of the month, you know, right after you start your menstruation, you're getting in the first part of the cycle, that's when you're a fasting machine if you want to be. Like you can push your fasting limits a little bit, go 16, 18, 20 hours. But then later, midway through the month, when it's time for ovulation, you're not going to want to push yourself so much. And especially not at the end of the month, right before your next period, when we may have a little bit of PMS or what have you, you definitely don't want to be pushing your fast at that point because your body naturally is in a little bit of an insulin resistant phase there and you're craving carbs and things like that. But I really feel like the 12-hour starting point is pretty doable for just about any of us. And if you're only at the 8 right now, just try to add 30 minutes you know, once a week. And then by, by the time a month or so has happened, you're already into your 12 hours. And then if you want to extend that based upon the time of the month or whatever, you should be able to do that. So that's kind of the easy starting point. You guys have to check out the grill that everyone's talking about. The Schwank Grill heats up to 1,500 degrees to grill the juiciest steak you've ever tasted in as little as three minutes. This is the portable infrared gas grill that'll deliver world-class steakhouse quality steaks like think Ruth Chris, Morton's, Del Frisco's Cut 432 from your home. It'll be the best grill that you will ever have using infrared heating technology that heats up to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, creating the perfect sear and the juiciest steak you've ever tasted in as little as three minutes. Made in the USA with the same technology used in top steakhouses since the 1980s, now accessible to all of us. Steak, chicken, veggies, salmon, burgers, chicken wings, it'll soon be your favorite thing in your house. At 1500 degrees, you can get that perfect delicious crust on both sides of your steak without overcooking it, and the steak is incredibly juicy and flavorful. There's truly nothing like this grill, and this really is the future of grilling. I'm really just sitting here salivating thinking about these darn steaks. You can use the code KDP to get you $150 off Schwank Grills. Go to schwankgrills.com. That's S-C-H-W-A-N-K Grills and use the code KDP for $150 off. Yeah, I love all of those tips. I myself constantly forget that the cycle will change our ability to take on carbohydrates or fast and 
how many times I need to be reminded after I've, you know, done a carb bomb in the morning before a workout and it's day two of my cycle. And I'm like, oh, I don't feel so good. It's like, yeah, of course, Leanne, because it's day one or two of your cycle. So yeah, that stuff really does make a big difference. Now, so we're talking a little bit about fasting here and you mentioned metabolism. Are there other ways that we can boost our energy and metabolism through this simple process? Yeah, I mean, a simple, simple, simple hack that... It almost sounds too simple. It, it sounds ridiculous. It's just drink more water. And, and what I mean by that is just make sure that you're hydrated. Most of us go throughout our day a little bit dehydrated. And so what I would ask all of us to do as our morning routine, like literally one of the first things you do when you get out of bed, drink 16, 17, 18 ounces of water. Like start your day with that and then you're already winning. <laughs> and it's that easy because when you're hydrated, everything works better. All of the metabolic machinery that you have, like literally everything just works so much better, so much smoother. And there's even this process that, I mean, it sounds kind of uh, real scientific, but it's basically water itself, just the act of drinking water can actually speed up our metabolism a little bit, can increase our metabolism's ability to function and function well. And that's just called the thermogenic effect of, of water, basically. And so when we consume or drink, I should say, uh, water, that actually will boost your metabolism. And I just recommend that you stay on top of that throughout the day. And, and the other thing is most of us kind of have this notion that you know we might go a couple hours after a meal and then we feel like, oh, maybe I should eat a little something. I'm feeling like that urge. I'm feeling a tiny bit hungry. Well, I would ask you the next time you feel that, instead of reaching for any kind of a snack that might provide any calories at all, just drink a full glass of water. Drink 12 ounces of water when you feel a little bit hungry. And most of the time, that hunger dissipates because the area of our brain called the hypothalamus is what responds to both thirst as well as to hunger. And the signals often get crossed. So in other words, when you may just be a little bit thirsty and your body's trying to say, hey, Drink a little bit more water, Leanne. You're just a little bit dehydrated. You're getting on the verge of that 2% and you're going to get a little bit of brain fog. You're not going to be as sharp and clear. You're not going to feel quite as awesome. Just drink some water. But sometimes those signals get crossed and you feel like, hey, Leanne's a little bit hungry. Maybe I should grab a snack right now because my energy is dipping a little bit. So next time you feel that, just drink a full glass of water and that could be the game changer for you. So thirst is is something that, you know, fortunately we all have, but that signal can get crossed with hunger. And so if we stay well hydrated, not only do we get that little bit of a metabolic boost, like I mentioned, the thermogenic effect of water, but also it just helps everything work that much better, more smoothly in, in every respect. So hydration is one of those secret sauces that sometimes we fall back on a little bit because we get busy. You know, we don't think about it. We're not carrying our our water bottle around with us wherever we go, or we just forget, you know, I always have uh, something to drink uh, right on my desk. I mean, always 100% of the time. And in my car, same thing. I got I got a water bottle that lives there. I got a glass water bottle pretty much everywhere in the house. And, you know, it's just, it's always staring me in the face. So it's a little bit easier. But before I did that, I had the same exact thing. I, you know, I'd feel a little bit hungry and I'd be like, do I need a snack or do I just need a full glass of water? So next, try try that full glass of water and see if that works for you. But simple act of staying hydrated could be a real game changer for you. And it actually helps your metabolism too. So so bonus right there. <laughs> yeah, completely. I started doing that about six months ago uh, when I got hungry. About an hour or two after eating, I started drinking water and now I'm up to a gallon of water a day consistently. Just making that simple switch. Um, so that was a really big deal. And a little tip, for those that keep water bottles in their car and around, just don't forget to bring your water bottles in and clean them because I can't tell you how many times we've <laughs> had, we have some issues. You know, I'll chat with clients and go through details and they have gut issues going on. I'm like, how often do you clean your water bottle? It's like, I don't clean it. It's just water. So make sure, <laughs> make sure to clean your water bottle. Okay. So we've talked about food. We've talked about fasting. We've talked about drinking water. Where does movement fit into all of this with the metabolism? And is this something that we should prioritize right away? Or what, what are your thoughts on movement? You mentioned walking a little bit ago, but how does this influence our metabolism? Oh my gosh, this is a huge lever for us, but it's not in the way that you would think. So traditionally, and this is one of my biggest pet peeves with sort of Western medicine and just a lot of the health, uh, old school, I should say, health advocates out there, you know, they always say, you know, 
all you got to do is exercise more and eat less. Like that's it. It's the simple formula of life. It's like not that simple actually. And what's even more interesting, and it's the reason I talk about food first, is that really in truth, food is, I think, in my humble opinion, probably the biggest lever that we have control over each and every day. And it's really difficult to exercise our way out of a really crappy diet. So in other words, exercise movement is super, super important, but you got to have a real whole foods diet to start with. It's no amount of exercise is going to cancel out all the negative effects of a really crappy diet. My favorite example of this was, uh, I don't know, about a decade ago, I was at Disneyland with my kids and I got six kids and I just happened to notice this guy had a shirt on that had like a really buff, you know, power lifter type on there. And it was actually a power lifter with the head of a raccoon. And it said, I work out so that I can eat garbage. And, you know, anybody that's ever seen a raccoon, those guys will like blast open the garbage cans, they'll eat anything and everything. And, and this is sadly the wrong <laughs> message. And it's a common one out there. People just think, oh, well, I can eat that candy. I can have this and that because it doesn't matter. I'm going to work off the calories. Food is way more than calories. Food is information. So you got to start with the whole foods, real foods first. But movement is so critical because what most people don't realize is... It doesn't exactly follow that first law of thermodynamics that we learned in chemistry class in high school, where it says matter and energy, for that matter, cannot be created nor destroyed. It only changes form. Well, actually, what's cool is if you move your body, you can actually generate even more energy than you're expending. In other words, you know, you think, oh, I, if I do so much, you know, say a cardio workout or I do some weight training or resistance training for 30 minutes. I'm just going to feel you know, more exhausted and tired afterwards because I used up so much energy to do that. Eh, wrong. You actually feel better. And anybody that does this knows how they feel. They feel great. They feel you know, just really just animated and active and vital after you exercise, provided you're not you know, exercising for three or four hours in a row. Like That's going to be a little bit too much. And then, yeah, you'll feel drained. But if you're doing that movement, it does a couple things for your body, even down at the cellular level. It actually causes those energy powerhouses called the mitochondria, it causes them to grow. In other words, increase in size and also replicate. So you get more of them. So it's, it's one of these really cool sort of physiologic lessons is that when you move your body, you'll actually be able to generate even more energy each and every time because you're doubling your mitochondria, and you're also growing them. They get bigger. It's kind of like muscles, right? They use it or lose it. Well, you're exercising those mitochondria every time you are doing some kind of movement in your body. And it can be super simple. Like we talked about, can be a simple walk. It doesn't have to be fancy. I personally do not have a gym membership. My wife does. She loves the gym. She's kind of a gym person. I just never have been. <laughs> I like to do stuff outside, go for a walk, go surfing, go skiing, go for a hike, whatever, mountain bike. I love to be outside. And, and I do have some weights around the house that I lift and, and I have a weight bench and things like that. But I'm, I'm not a gym guy. But what I know is that if I make it a priority to move my body throughout the day, it makes a world of difference. I mean, here's a simple example. Right now we're talking, Leanne, I'm not only standing up and talking to you, but I'm actually standing up on one of those funky, it looks like a surfboard. You know, Some people call it a wobble board or a surf trainer or whatever it is, but I can move around in all different directions while I talk to you. And that is not only <laughs> forcing me to get a little movement in while we chat, but it's also increasing my ability to, you know, my neurons that tell me where I am in time and space. You know, it's helping me with my balance. It's helping me, you know, with, with so many other things. And it is so simple. The other thing is just put a box on your desk and make it a standing desk. Go a, with a normal desk on top, you put a box, then you put your computer on that and you stand up. Stand up while you're at work. You know, simple, simple things that don't take a lot of, you know, money or, you know, thought. Literally a box on your desk can make a standing desk, you know, and you can simply do that and it'll change the game for you. You'll have more energy. You can tell your boss, I know it looks funny, but I'll actually be more productive. I promise the studies prove this, right? You've heard of the sitting is the new smoking thing. Well, it is in the sense that every recent study looking at the amount of hours that we sit in a day correlates exactly. It's a one-to-one, -one, you know, it's a direct relationship, as we call it. The more hours you sit, the more likely you'll have all these chronic illnesses that we're trying to avoid, right? The, the diabetes, the cancers, the heart, heart disease, all of that goes up with the more hours you sit in a day. So you got to move your body, you got to combat that, and it can be done 
really, really easily without a gym membership. <laughs> that is awesome. I switched over to a stand up desk probably about eight months ago, and it took me some time Yay. to get into the groove. And, you know, I'm doing it right now, I'm standing. Um, but I find when I really, really have to concentrate, I have to sit down. Like, <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's just if I'm really having, I just, I can't, I can't. But if I'm talking or interacting or things like that, I can stand. So I love the idea of a balancing board. And I think I'm going to incorporate that next because that is such a great idea. That is such a great idea. I love that idea. Okay. Another piece to this, because you've mentioned mitochondria and we haven't touched on this yet. Sleep. That is a huge, it's a huge problem for so many women, um, especially either not able to fall asleep or waking up in the middle of the night. What's going on with our sleep and how can we improve it? Oh my gosh, sleep. It, this is one of those, I think, secret weapons that we can all access relatively inexpensively and, and really freely in most cases. But First of all, we just have to decide that we're going to make it a priority. And I'll be honest, I was the biggest offender for many years, actually decades, in fact, where I did not prioritize my sleep. And part of it was just in the you know training that I got, I was basically told that every hour I slept, I was missing something in the hospital or the ER or whatever. And so I should try to sleep as little as possible. So I just wouldn't miss that you know, particular case that came in in the middle of the night or that emergency or that trauma or whatever. And so I had it ingrained in me that sleep was not that necessary. And, you know, part of it in those days, we just didn't understand. Fortunately, since at least 2006, when uh, Dr. Jeffrey Illiff and Nattergaard out of the University of Rochester came up with this whole process that we didn't appreciate before called the brain's glymphatic system, which is basically the process that flushes out all the toxins that build up and accumulate throughout the day and gets rid of them. And we take out the garbage, so to speak, and we flush the system, we flush the brain of all these uh, irritants, toxins, etc. This only effectively happens while we sleep. And there's a phenomenal YouTube video out there. You can uh, Google Dr. Jeffrey Illiff, I-L-I-F-F, -F, I believe, and, or just glymphatic system. And it's really phenomenal, the work they did. But they showed how important sleep is. And so now at least we have, you know, a better understanding of why we need to sleep. And I would say the first piece of advice I always give people to help them have the best night's sleep actually starts first thing in the morning. So if you get up within an hour or so of sunrise, I would encourage you to take two minutes and go outside without sunglasses, please go outside and just go for a quick walk, whether it be around your house, just in your yard or one lap around the neighborhood or if it's on your way to work or whatever that looks like in the parking lot at work, get there a few minutes early, like whatever that looks like in your situation. If you can get outdoors for about two or three minutes in the morning and let that natural sunlight hit your eyes, you know, the back of the retina, you have these uh, uh, photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that help set your circadian rhythm. If they see natural light, that really helps to get your body synchronized with the day and it will help tremendously with your sleep at night. So your best night sleep ever starts in the morning. That's the first hint. <laughs> and then when you get into the nighttime part, a couple of things that you have to kind of give yourself a little bit of leadway preparing is that one, you know, obviously we shouldn't be drinking caffeine, you know, towards the back half of the day. I mean, the studies really show that by about 2 p.m., we really shouldn't be having any caffeine. So at least six to eight hours before bed, you really don't want to be having anything caffeinated. Also, if you like to have a drink, you know, at night or whatever, just don't make that the norm because most of us know this, but alcohol gets you to sleep quicker, but it tremendously you know, affects the quality. It, it really wrecks. It wrecks the quality of your sleep. Plus, you're going to be up and you're going to be peeing in a couple hours anyway. And anyway, the, the, it's real. The, the struggle is real. Alcohol is certainly a toxin and it definitely can uh, really wreck your sleep. And so try to avoid that uh, for the most part. And, and if you do have a drink every now and again, just don't make it every single night because that's really going to affect the quality of your sleep. And then the biggest thing that I think people can take home today is just make it a very simple, repeatable routine. So I know this sounds a little hard, especially if you like to go out and your bedtimes change throughout the week. Do the best you can to make it a really, you know, pretty solid, you know, every night by X time, whether it's nine o'clock or 10 o'clock or whatever that looks like for you, have a routine. And I think anybody, especially the ladies out there that have young kids, like they know how badly kids need a bedtime routine. If they don't have a really solid bedtime routine, 
not only are they hosed, but you're hosed because you're getting up in the middle of the night because they're cranky or something's going on. Like they need a really good routine at night. Well, guess what? We as adults need a really good routine and it's got to be consistent. So try to pick a bedtime that you can consistently meet each and every night, preferably by 10 o'clock because there's this surge of growth hormone that happens around 10, 10 ish at night that you're going to totally miss out on if you're staying up really late every single night kind of thing. So try to get into bed at a reasonable hour, make it consistent. And then just the practice of it, there's a couple simple things like don't eat within about three hours before bed. That's what I like to call a food curfew. All right. So just like uh, if we have kids, you know, we give them a curfew, right? Well, I do the same thing with myself with respect to food. You want to have a food curfew prior to bedtime. And I usually like to encourage people to try for three hours, three hours before bed, because not only will that help with that you know, 12 hour window that we talked about a little while ago, but it'll also help you to get that solid quality sleep that you've been dreaming of. Because I don't know if any of you guys have had this experience, guys and gals alike, you go out to eat, you're with friends, you're, you're up a little later, you have a later meal, and then you crash out because you, know, you eat a big meal and it's like, woo, you know, you're kind of tired, like after the Thanksgiving meal type of thing. So you go to bed, but then you wake up an hour or two later and you're like, Oh my gosh, I am not feeling amazing. You know, you have a super uh, unrestful sleep. And that's because for two reasons. One, uh, as we talked about, you know, the food itself, when you digest it, assimilate it, break it down and all of that, it's super taxing, takes a lot of energy. But also you'll often have this kind of reactive hypoglycemia after a big meal like that. And so your body notices the fall in both glucose and insulin about you know one and a half to two hours after your meal. And it's like, hey, you might be getting a little hungry and you wake up and you're like, that is the weirdest thing ever. I ate this huge meal and like I'm feeling a little bit like I want to grab a snack right now. <laughs> you know? So you wake up for that. And so having a, a window, I like to shoot for three hours of not eating at least anything with calories. If you want to have a tea at night or or something like that that's not going to have calories or that's not going to have you know uh, caffeine in it, then that's totally cool. I'm totally up for that. Water, whatever. Just don't drink a lot, especially if you're you're getting closer to you know 50s and beyond. You don't want to drink too much at night. You're going to get up and pee, especially if you're a dude. Uh, I know I do, so I don't drink a lot at night. But uh, food curfew is really important. The second thing, which I feel is harder, is that device curfew, right? You know, the the TV, the cell phone, the iPad, the Kindle, like whatever that is. Like you got to turn that stuff off. I ideally two hours before bed. Honestly, that's really hard for most of us. Even me, I do a bunch of work from home these days. And so my sort of threshold is one hour before bed. So start with that. If you can extend it to two hours before bed, even more golden. And the reason for that is obviously, you know, most of these devices emit wavelength of light in the blue light spectrum, which really jacks with your circadian rhythm. And basically, it basically precludes or prevents the typical nighttime rise in melatonin, which helps you get ready for sleep. And so if you're staring into a screen of any kind, I don't care if it's on that special nighttime mode or whatever, it's still going to be emitting some blue light and it's delaying that release of melatonin. And so your sleep is going to be a little bit off. And so try to set the goal of one hour because I feel like that's totally doable. And then when you achieve the one hour mark, see if you can go two hours with no devices prior to bed. And what's really cool about that is it forces you to be a little bit creative. You know, well, what am I going to do? I'm not going to be watching TV. I'm not going to be on my phone checking my messages or Instagram or whatever it is that you're checking on your phone emails. I have to do something else. For me, I love to read at night. And <laughs> it's really funny because my wife, she cracks up. I literally sit and I have this chair next to a fireplace at home where I have <laughs> one of these old school like headlamps that you use for camping, but it's a it's a red light headlamp. So it, it sends off just red <laughs> wavelength light. Now I sit in my chair and I'm reading a book with my headlamp <laughs> because all the lights in the house are off. <laughs> and I'm just reading by red light. And that's not going to mess up you know, my circadian rhythm like blue light or just your household, especially if you have LED. Like, Please turn that stuff off at night. Or if you have a dimmer, try to start dimming those things down a couple hours before bed just to kind of get your body ready for bed. But having that device curfew for me has been a real game changer because I used to work up until the moment I'm like, okay, it's... 11 o'clock at night, I got to quit. And I would send off my last email and then I would try to go to sleep. And guess what I noticed? Same thing that you notice. Your mind is like a literal hamster wheel. You just can't stop. Like the wheels are turning. You can't just turn it off. <laughs> and part of that's the blue light thing. And part of it's just the busyness. And so another little hack that a lot of people will try is this notion of having sort of a nighttime dump, if you will. And I don't mean a physical dump on the toilet. I mean sort of a brain dump, a mental dump, where you just take a piece of paper or a notebook journaling, whatever works for you. And you just write all of the stuff that's on your mind, whether it be 
remembrances of the day, like a journaling type of thing, or just anything and everything that comes to mind. So you can kind of dump that so you're not lying in bed thinking about all of the things, you know, whatever those things are. Do a little mental dump before bedtime. And then if you like doing the journaling thing, write in your journal, that's a good way to spend that one to two hours before bed. Um, I love doing a little gratitude journal. I feel like that's super helpful for me just to kind of get into that zone where I'm feeling restful, peaceful, and in sort of that good frequency, if you will. Or other things people love to do, things like hopping in a warm bath and just kind of... You can read a book, you can listen to music, you know, just whatever really helps you kind of settle down. Find what that is and then make it a routine for yourself. And then once you got that solid routine, uh, it can help you tremendously. I mean, there's lots of other, you know, stuff you can do different nighttime supplements and things like that, 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 you know, may be helpful. But I think starting with a really basic routine that you can duplicate every day, that's the biggest game changer. And it all starts in the morning. First thing in the morning with that exposure to natural light, it can be that simple. We know that we lose muscle as we age and that this loss massively affects our ability to function. Like I'm talking basic tasks here. Muscle is important for protecting our joints and also keeping our metabolism revving. Basically, you want muscle. And unfortunately, a lot of us just don't prioritize muscle maintenance or see it as an importance. And you may also be cringing at the idea of going to the gym and being able to maintain that muscle consistently. Yes, active moving is super good. And there's really nothing like it when it comes to the mood boost of pumping iron. (laughs) So when I share about Urolithin A, I am not saying just to do this and you can maintain your muscle without movement. Well, like I am saying that because Urolithin A does do that. But I think pairing Urolithin A with exercise is likely the best path forward. So I started taking a product called MitoPure to boost my performance and improve muscular strength. And MitoPure has 500 milligrams per serving of urolithin A, a postbiotic shown to have major benefits to significantly increasing muscle strength and endurance with no other change in lifestyle. Yes, you heard that right. I just said that it has major benefits to significantly increase muscle strength and endurance with no other change to lifestyle. It gives your body the energy it needs to optimize its cellular power grid through boosted mitochondrial health without changes to lifestyle or diet. Now imagine what it could do with your low carb diet and a walking goal or a lifting goal a couple of times per week. It took me a long time, like a couple of months to introduce MitoPure to my day because it's so strong. Every time I took it, I almost had too much energy, so I really had to titrate up. MitoPure is the first product to offer a precise dose of urolithin A to upgrade mitochondrial function, increase cellular energy, and improve muscle strength and endurance. They've created three ways to get your daily dose of 500 milligrams of urolithin A in their product, MitoPure. They've got a delicious vanilla protein powder that combines muscle building protein with the cellular energy of MitoPure. Now this product does contain whey protein. And then they have a berry powder that easily mixes into smoothies or just about any drink. This is dairy free. And finally the soft gels, which is what I prefer because it's just easier. This is also dairy free. I love the starter pack idea though. If you can handle the dairy, the three forms of MitoPure to play around with which one is your favorite top notch. So timeline, the creators of MitoPure is putting together a sweet little offer for you 10% off your first order. So if you go to timeline nutrition.com slash KDP and use the code KDP, you'll get 10% off your order. Again, that's timeline nutrition.com slash KDP. I recommend trying their starter pack with all three formats and picking out your best format. Again, that's timeline nutrition.com slash KDP. 
I have the exact same red light headlamp. I feel like your wife and my husband could share stories about all the silly things they see us doing <laughs> because <laughs> Kevin came outside and I was sitting on the porch with my red light, like cuddled up looking at the stars. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, uh, yes. Yeah, so. Getting ready for the best night of sleep ever. Ever. <laughs> I really slept well that night. So there you, there you go. Uh, awesome. I guess the last piece is stress. Like just the go, go, go. And even our diets can, you know, all the things that we've shared today can cause stress. How do we manage this? What is the body doing when we perceive stress? And and how can we lower this issue or even take it seriously? A lot of people say like, I know I'm stressed. I just can't change anything. So it is what it is. But what are your thoughts on stress? Oh, I love that. I can't change anything. Well, I'm going to I'm going to relay a study here that will change your mind right now if you've ever thought that I can't change anything. So, one of my favorite studies of all times, especially with respect to stress, comes from the Journal of Health Psychology in 2012. And this was Dr. Keller and colleagues and they had an N or a study population of over 180,000 patients. So huge, huge cohort. They followed them for a couple of decades. And what they were specifically looking at in this study was their stress. And so what they, what they did at the onset of the study, they said, okay, we want you guys and gals to rate your stress. Is it a high level of stress, a medium level, or a low level of stress? And they had to kind of decide if their lives were you know, high, medium, or low level of stress. And so they rated that. And then over the duration, the couple decades of the study, they followed them to see if they got chronic disease like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, neurodegenerative disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, whatever. They followed all these things. And, and then obviously, if they died, you know, they made a note of that. And so at the end of the study, they were like, whoa, this is super interesting. So what we kind of thought was true, in other words, that the more stress you had, the more health conditions you had, the sooner you died, all of that was only partly true. So what was kind of cool was in this group where people rated that they had the highest level of stress, it was only the people in that group that believed that stress was bad for them that had those conditions. It was sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The people that say, oh, this stress is going to kill me. Well, it might, (laughs) you know, or this stress is going to give me an ulcer. Well, it might. You know, if they believed that the stress was negative and that it could adversely affect their health, then they had a higher likelihood that this would happen. But the opposite of that also occurred. In other words, in that high stress group, there were a group of people, a subset that believed that stress could be good for them. It could be growth promoting. It could be something that would propel them into future success because they may use it as a growth experience, an opportunity to learn, grow, achieve, pivot, whatever that was. They did not believe that it was inherently bad. And those people, though they had a very high stress life, for them, interestingly enough, the stress was protective. In other words, they had less incidence of chronic disease They actually lived longer. And so having this high level of stress for them because of their belief was actually protective. So to the person who has ever thought, oh, I just can't do anything about it. uh," You actually can do a lot. And it starts right between your ears. What, What you may not be able to do is affect sort of all these global things that are happening around us that cause us to have a lot of stress. That's beyond your control. Totally fine, right? The last three years of the pandemic, it's like, None of us would have predicted that or wanted that or whatever, but how we chose to respond to that made all of the difference. You know, whether we had to pivot in our business, we had to go from brick and mortar to online or whatever that looked like in our case, taking that same stress that we all were exposed to and using that as a growth promoting experience as opposed to just that typical stressful, you know, what we would call in sort of physiology, the sympathetic nervous system response, that fight or flight that it's good that we have it, especially if we're being chased by a lion. But if we're just being exposed to all of the different things that happen in our lives, if we always have that system, the sympathetic sort of fight and flight system going on, that can be significantly damaging to our health, all the way to the metabolism, even down to the very mitochondria that we were talking about earlier stress can negatively impact that. And so the cool thing I want everybody to learn just right here now today that you actually have control of the meaning that you attach to whatever stressful event happens in your life. And we, we will all have, and we many of us have had significant stressors in our lives. And it could be you know, a family or loved one, family member, loved one that we lost, or it could be illness. It could be loss of a job. Whatever that is, we all will have things that happen, but 
we get to decide how we will approach that, the meaning that we'll attach to it, and whether we choose to grow from it or just allow it to negatively impact us. So that's number one. And then there's lots of cool things that we can do, as you say or said earlier, to manage the stress. I like to use the word optimize stress because I just think it has a more positive connotation. Manage just sounds like, oh, we just have to deal, you know? And I'm more about healing than dealing. I think we just need to figure out how to heal and move on and not just deal. And so optimizing our stress can look like what, what we spoke of as far as you know the meaning that we attach to it, but also in the things that we do. So whether that be breath work, for example, I love taking a couple of moments. And for me, I'll be honest, I'm not a big meditator. I'm not going to take 30 to 60 minutes and just you know, allow my... And I do, I do occasionally, but I got six kids and I work a couple jobs and I like to get up early to do all sorts of things. So I take two or three minutes, sometimes five or 10, and I just breathe. And often I'll go outside and I'll do that simultaneously while I'm getting my light exposure, while I'm getting my movement because I'm walking, but I don't bring my cell phone. You know, I just allow myself to soak it in, to soak in the light, the sounds, the colors, or absence of color if it's fall or winter, like whatever that looks like. And I just breathe. And that can be magic. Just as simple as six, five or six breaths, you know, that's like a minute of meditative time, mindfulness time. We can all figure out how to incorporate that into our lives, right? Even if we have to go into the bathroom and pretend we're on the pot, like just take a minute or two to yourself a couple of times a day and just breathe. And you can use whatever technique you want. You can use the box breathing. You can, you know, there's so many techniques out there. Just pick whatever works for you, but just close your eyes, put your hand on your heart, just breathe five or six times. Boom, a minute has gone by. You've refocused. Your physiology has completely changed and it can make such a difference and it doesn't have to take an hour. So those are, and, and then there's other things, of course, that we can talk about with stress optimization as far as you know, movement can really be helpful for stress, you know, optimization. That's one of my go-tos if I'm super stressed and it's like, I need an adult timeout. I may take a few breaths, but I may just jump outside and go for a quick walk around the block, (laughs) you know, take a walk or, you know, jump on my bike or skateboard or whatever I can do quickly in a couple of minutes just to move my body and just kind of get my wiggles out because I think most adults need to get their wiggles out too. It's not just the kids, but that moment of movement can be magical and changing the physiology, changing whatever stressful situation hits. So those are kind of my, you know, quick and dirty how to optimize stress in your life right there. I love it all, Dr. Thomas. You're amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us how to optimize all these areas of our life and give us like really simple tools. That's what I love about what you share. Where can people find more from you? Oh, thank you for that, Leanne. Um, easiest place is uh, on my website, thomashemingway.com. So it's just my name, T-H-O-M-A-S, and then Hemingway spelled with one M, just like Ernest spelled at thomashemingway.com or on Instagram, D-R for Dr. Thomas Hemingway. And I also have a podcast, uh, Unshakable Health, which you were on already. It was an amazing episode. So follow me there as well. And then my book is called Preventable. Five Powerful Practices to Avoid Disease and Build Unshakable Health. You can pre-order that today and it will be available um, the back half of February wherever books are sold. And uh, you can check it out on my website, thomashemingway.com and even pre-order today. So thank you for that. Oh, of course. Yeah, you're welcome back anytime. Thanks again for hanging out with me. Oh, it's been so much fun. And just want to say mahalo as we do in Hawaii and a big aloha to everybody out there. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed our time with Dr. Thomas Hemingway. Again, you can connect with him by going to thomashemingway.com. And I hope to see you back here for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. Bye. Thanks for listening. Join us next Tuesday for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. Looking for more resources? Go to healthfulpursuit.com for keto meal plans, weight loss programs, low carb recipes, and oodles of free resources to get you going. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program. 